Hey guys, uh, welcome everyone who's, uh, who's watching on the live stream. Uh, my name is Reto, I'm a developer advocate on the Android Developer Relations team. I'm uh, joined by uh, Dan and Ian. And uh, on screen, we're very fortunate to, uh, to have with us uh, Chris Pruitt and uh, Ruben Stratton from Yo. Uh, Robot Invader. Hi. Hi. Students, respectively. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for joining us, guys, and being our guinea pigs for our first developer interview. Thanks for having us. This is awesome. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so this is going to be a little bit interesting. We haven't done one of these uh, interviews before, but I have my trusty interviewer pad. Uh, we've got uh, a Google moderator going as well, so if uh, people are watching and would uh, like to join in and ask some questions, throw them in the moderator page, and uh, after we've finished uh, this little bit of uh, interviewing, I'm going to open this up to my extended circles as well, so we'll hopefully have some live questions. So, uh, so let's get started. Uh, let's start, start by uh, telling us a little bit about um, the games you guys have developed. We'll start with, uh, with you, Chris, because you're on my left. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Wind Up Night. Okay. Uh, Wind Up Night is a 3D action platformer game. We shipped it for all Android devices that support OpenGL ES 2.0 and above in the uh, very end of October of last year, like the 27th, 28th, something like that. Uh, and I think it's a pretty great game. You you run forward constantly. Um, the, the character can't stop moving, and your goal is to jump and double jump and roll and slash your way through each of our 52 levels. Um, feedback has been pretty phenomenal. Our Android market ranking uh, rating right now is, I think it's four and a half out of five stars, and it's stayed pretty solid there since our release. And we have uh, 1.5 million users at the moment. Uh, so we're very happy with the response. Very nice. You guys have, you guys have played the game, right? You guys have played oh, yeah. a lot of Android games. Yeah, Absolutely. I suck at it. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a good game. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm too much of a completist. I want, I want to get S rank on every single level. So. We made the game just for you, Dan. Yeah, it's too much. And uh, Ruben, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Solitaire Ultra? I'm guessing the, it does a lot of what it says on the tin. Uh, pretty much. Uh, it's not my first game for Android, but it's the first one that makes serious use of OpenGL. And uh, unlike Chris, I'm a bit of an amateur. I like games in my spare time and do much more mundane Android stuff uh, day to day. And uh, I'm at the other end of the installs at the minute, quite deliberately at the minute, because we've got um, a couple of device-specific problems that need ironing out. And uh, so I've sort of suspended all the advertising things like that. But uh, it's, it's been received pretty well. I think it's uh, a, a pretty good implementation of Solitaire. It's at least as good as uh, anything else I've seen so far. It's a popular game. People seem to love it. My family and my wife and so on, that everyone's addicted to it and play it constantly, which is very nice. I'm hoping that they'll sort of be similarly addicted in the wider world. Yeah, I think you, uh, you picked a good time to, uh, to release it as well, just during the holiday period. We've got a lot of people you know, with new toys not necessarily wanting something too uh, action-packed to, uh, to play, to chill out. By the way, Rayto, Bonker in New Zealand says, speak up. Speak up. All right, I will speak more loudly and invest in it. What was that to me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll move a little closer. All right. Um, okay, cool. So that's that's a, a good bit of background. So I guess, um, I guess given that this is a technical forum, the question which most people are going to want to know is, how did you guys go around... Uh, building your applications? Were they built using a, a game platform, the whole thing from scratch? Um, you know, how did you go about it? Again, Chris, do you want to go off? Sure. So before working uh, on Wind Up Night, I have built other game engines for, for Android. The, the one that actually turned into a game was a game called Replica Island, which I released a couple of years ago. And that was entirely Java. And uh, before, in between Replica Island and before uh, working on Wind Up Night, I played around with some NDK stuff and writing some code in, in C++ and then sort of bootstrapping it with Java and, and doing all my, my, re my rendering that way. But uh, for Wind Up Night, we decided to use Unity, which is a third-party game engine, and it's pretty phenomenal. It, it, what it provides is not just a game runtime that, that runs quite well on Android, but it also provides this uh, huge tool chain. It gives you 
an editor, it gives you an authoring environment, it gives you a programming environment at the debugger, uh, and allows you to rapidly build uh, on a PC and then deploy directly to the Android device very quickly. So we used Unity, um, and I wrote most of the game code in C Sharp, and then all of Unity is sort of hosted in a Java Dalvik shell uh, that, that does a bunch of stuff that is specific to um, Android, mostly UI rendering and also things like billing interface and um, popping in notifications and things like that. Okay. And were there any particular trade-offs uh, about using Unity versus building it all either in Java yourself or in uh, using the NDK? Sure. I mean, the trade-off with using any sort of third-party engine is that the engines are going to come with quirks that you can't control. Um, so, for example, our startup time is a little bit long on some devices. It might take five seconds before you actually get to the main menu, or on a particularly slow device, even longer than that. Um, and there's really nothing that I can do about that. And it, it's actually not particularly Unity's fault either, but um, if this was something I'd written from scratch, that's the sort of thing I'd be able to optimize. On the other hand, if I had written Wind Up Night from scratch, there's no way we could have done it in the amount of time that we did it. We, we built that game with three people in five months, uh, and I'm the only engineer on the project. And if I were to build it in, in C++, which is probably the, the next most viable approach, it, it would have taken me probably twice that long. So the trade-off is, you know, you, you accept some um, quirks or limitations that, that come with the engine. Although, honestly, in, in Unity's case, there's very, very few of those. Uh, and the benefit is your boilerplate stuff is all there. Your editor is there. Your tools are there. And they're much better than for the most part, anything you would build yourself in a short amount of time. So for us, it was a huge win. We'll be using it again in the future. Nice. And uh, Ruben, I, I believe you um, built everything from scratch. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, not because I'm an idiot, but because I wanted to actually learn OpenGL in some real detail. I, I'd, I'd worked at the device driver level before now, but never really got to grips with the API properly. And that was a very interesting experience, and very worth doing, I feel. Um, it was actually Chris who helped me keep it at 50 frames per second on um, tablet devices, which was quite a battle of sort of reordering things so things are drawn in the right order and there isn't much overdraw. And I, I don't know if, if Unity is much help with that. Um, it, it's easy to imagine that an engine wouldn't allow that kind of optimization, but I could be wrong about that. Right. So just to jump in there, there's... Um for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with sort of the best practices of using OpenGL on a mobile device, the, basically your, your, your long pole is always going to be filled. The amount of time it takes to draw a pixel, um, it, whether to memory or, or directly to VRAM, is always going to be slow. So you want to draw as few pixels as possible, which effectively means you don't want to draw the same pixel twice per frame. Uh, so if you're drawing something that's a scene and you have the choice of drawing it front to back or back to front, you always draw it front to back because the things in the front will occlude the things in the back and you can end up not drawing those things. If you draw back to front, you're going to be drawing uh, over the same pixels many times and because fill is slow, that will kill you. So that's the same whether you're using Unity or you're writing anything from scratch. Um, so what Ruben was saying is, what, what, well, if you're using Unity, do you have that level of control? And the answer is, with Unity, you generally do. Generally, Unity is smart enough to do the right thing on the platform you're on. Um, its, its, renders are, its renderer is optimized specifically for OpenGL ES 2.0. So it, it has a pretty good idea. And when it's not sure, you have the ability to sort of go in and force it to behave a certain way. Um, but it's also true that if you are coding it to the metal, um, like Ruben did, that you have a lot more opportunity for fine-tuning. Like you can be very, very careful about how you organize your data and how your data lives in memory and how you pass that down to the video card. And yeah, I don't think nothing a lot of that. Right. And that's, that's often the, the sort of key to optimization. When you use something like Unity, you sort of just leave it in their hands and hopes it works out. In our case, it did, but um, that is another trade-off. Now, that, that being said, you did, you, did, you did go and make one optimization in terms of the size of vertex buffers and stuff like that very, very specifically, even, after, even on something like Unity. Um, right. So... What Dan's referring to is we had a bug that was specific to the Samsung Galaxy S2, and it, which is a Mali chipset, which is a very um, modern, cool 3D chipset that unfortunately has a bug um, 
was probably related to the size of a vertex buffer. If a particular vertex buffer becomes too large, or perhaps if there's too many things indexing into it, uh, the, the driver seems to go down some terrible slow path and your frame rate falls apart. Which is too bad, because that device is otherwise an extreme powerhouse, and it ran our game very well. So we found, uh, thanks to a user uh, pointing out an article to us, a little write-up about how this uh, problem could affect this particular device in something completely separate than Unity. And the guy said, oh, I was working on a Quake 3 port, and I found this problem, and here's how I fixed it. And once I knew what the problem was, I was able to go back in and tell Unity on that particular device, you know, hey, you know, don't put these meshes together into one buffer when you thought you were going to do that. Um, and that's sort of a hack, and it was the only device-specific code we ended up with the, in the entire uh, game. But yeah, that was uh, a little bit of tuning that one had to do. That's, that's an interesting point, and I know, uh, Ruben, you were alluded to it a little bit earlier on, so I'll, I'll, I'll go there and delve in a little bit deeper. What, what challenges, if any, did you guys find uh, developing for the you know, diverse range of Android devices that are out there? Is that the question? Are you asking Chris that? Uh, no, I'll ask you, Ruben. I think Chris uh, thinks Chris already kind of answered it. I'll give him another bite of the cherry, but uh, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm at the moment just going through the pain of finding uh, which devices are actually causing me problems. Unfortunately, that information isn't terribly visible um, on, in the market. Um, so, for example, we've got, I've got a couple of crash reports uh, which say platform other, and it, it's buried in sort of OpenGL setup. There's something wrong with uh, the context creation there, or the uh, EGL config. But I, I have absolutely no idea what platforms that's are carrying on. It certainly never happened on any of my eight devices. And um, yeah, so I'm just getting a handle on that at the minute. I'm just waiting for someone to sort of come back in one of their reviews to say, hey, it doesn't work with my Motorola this or Samsung, whatever. Um, I, I've been using Device Anywhere and Perfecto Mobile and just going through whatever devices I can. I haven't hit any, found any problems yet. One thing that I noticed um, about user reports is that there's a pervasive idea among Android users that there are going to be device-specific issues. And so often, when there is an issue, people will chalk it up to something wrong with the software or something wrong with the device. So we haven't had so many of these on, uh, on Wind Up Night, but on Replica Island, I had a lot of people say, like, oh, crashes on Droid. That would be the comment. Or um, Nexus 1 crashes at second level. And I look into those problems, and in fact, you know, I was like dividing by zero or something like that. It, yeah, it crashed on Droid, and it crashed on Nexus 1, and it crashed on every other device too because it was totally my fault. Um, but the user doesn't know how to tell the difference between a device-specific problem and a, just a regular bug. So often, I, would no I noticed, at least in, in our reviews, we'd say, like, um, I have X device and, and Y problem. And the assumption being that the problem is with the specific combination of the software and X device. Uh, where generally I found that that was not the case. There are certainly some bumps. Um, I'll segue into the problems that we had. Um, other than the, the Mali problem that I already mentioned, we didn't have too many uh, actual device runtime problems. There was a range of devices from HTC. The sensation is the, the main one that have or had very broken graphics drivers. And about a month after we shipped, HTC shipped an update that corrected those. So we didn't actually have to do anything. HTC was on it and they, they fixed it, which is fantastic because it allowed us to sort of unblacklist those devices. Otherwise, we would not have had a way to fix them. Um, the other big problem that we had was not related to our code at all but just that we have an application that's larger than 30 megabytes. And there's a whole range of Samsung devices that are incapable of downloading large applications. All that um, tiny partition, yeah. Right, so there's a, there's a lot of users out there who have a lot of really nice Samsung devices, and um, they're unable to, uh, to download large applications. That's actually fixed now. This is my daughter. Say hi, sweetie. Could you wait for me outside for a moment? Sweet. No, Daddy. Yes, no. please. <laughs> so, um, so the uh, Samsung Galaxy S and Infuse and Vibrant and all of the other sort of 
similar devices uh, from Samsung that have the same problem, those users were all very incensed that they're unable to download the game. And they don't understand that, you know, their device is flawed, and they don't understand that the developer has no control over downloads from markets. So we, you know, got this huge deluge of emails from folks saying, I can't download the game. So we go into Android Market and say, okay, you're no longer compatible. And then we get emails saying, why isn't my device compatible? Um, fortunately, Android Market uh, has been modified to work around that problem. And as of uh, late last year, we unblacklisted all of those devices. And um, now everything is fine. We're great. The only device now that we have blacklisted is the, uh, is the Motorola Droid. And that's because it simply doesn't have enough memory to run our game. There's nothing wrong with the device itself. Excuse me for just a moment. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll ask you uh, the next question while, while we wait for Chris to return, uh, Ruben. Uh, so I, I was wondering, um, do you use any, you know, Chris was saying, you know, often the, the user feedback that you get through comments isn't necessarily the most reliable. Do you use any sort of in-game analytics to be able to track how people are playing the game, uh, bug tracking? No, not yet. That was uh, that was on the to-do list, certainly. But uh, we kind of run out of time. We're getting up to like Christmas Eve, and we thought, well, okay, something's going to go to the back of the list. And I didn't think it would be that interesting anyway, so I cut out the sort of analytics side. But yeah, that'll be going in soon, sure. So, so at the moment, you're relying uh, predominantly just on sort of your own intuition, user feedback through comments, those sorts of things? Yes. Well, I, I did a sort of closed beta of everyone I knew pretty much, in, uh, including yourself, I believe, <laughs> with an Android device. And, um, yeah, no one found any problems at all. Or I wouldn't have, wouldn't have launched the thing, but that clearly problems exist. Um, I wish I'd launched it with the beta label now, because I think people are a lot more tolerant of, um, you know, if it falls flat on its face. They're not going to one star you if it says beta on it. They'll say, oh, these guys need to know about this rather than you idiots. And yeah, so with hindsight, I wish I'd, I'd slap beta on it. I've, I've put it up there now, and I hope I don't get into trouble for sort of doing that in retrospect, but it, I feel it's kind of necessary until I find, you know, where the, the problems some people are having are. So that's interesting. So you actually found that the, uh, the tone of the feedback that you were getting from users was uh, much less critical, uh, simply by describing the app as beta in, in the market listing. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, that's not, I mean, that's not just with this project, that's just uh, previous projects um, in, over the past two and a half years. Yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't do it with this one, I was quite confident that it was, but it was completely bug and issue three. That's clearly not the case. Uh, Work for Google. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, I just uh, was just asking Ruben, uh, Chris, if uh, you know, if you used any in-game analytics. So the same same question for you. Do you uh, track user progress and, and those sorts of things using analytics inside the game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we use the Google Analytics as our backend, and it it has a couple of features that are. I mean, it's originally built for web pages, right? But it has a couple of features that are make it real easy to use for tracking user behavior, and it's nice because it aggregates everything and it's completely anonymous. So um, we don't have to worry about, you know, whether we're accidentally collecting information that we shouldn't have. We also don't have to worry about our own servers scaling up to handle crazy load or something like that. Um, but basically what we track is how long do people play? Well, what levels do they die on? Where in the level do they die? Uh, we also look at what items are most popular, and we look at certain user behavior things. Like I pop up a uh, dialog box that says, Hey, you've been playing the game for a while. Would you like to go right on Android Market? And I can tell how many people say yes or no to that. Um, so we do do a lot of tracking of behavioral things. We don't, and also because of the way analytics works, we get for free sort of tracking about where people are at. We can look at our user breakdown. We know, for example, that Japan is our number two market. Um, thanks to thanks to analytics. We also know that our number three market is China, where the game is not actually available, uh, which, is, which is real interesting data, right? Maybe that means that we should be putting some ads uh, in our game for when it's running in a device that doesn't have Android Market installed. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of analytics, and we use it differently every game. I use the analytics differently this time than I did last time around. Yeah, that was actually but, 
ahead of how, how do the analytics compare to the breakdown you get from market? Obviously, China is different. Um, um, basically, China's the the outlier. Okay. Market doesn't report to Chinese users because they're not getting it via market. Um, and everybody else mostly is getting it through via market. But our um, our top four, I believe, are U.S., Japan, China, Taiwan. That's kind of the breakdown. So we did Japanese localization for uh, for Wind Up Night, and that appears to have been a major win based on the Japanese numbers. Probably we should do um, Chinese localization as well, and Taiwanese localization as well. Did you do the uh, localization based on the fact that a lot of users were from Japan, or did you, you know, see that it was a large market and do the localization in the hope that you'd be able to or get a lot of customers? Or did you just happen to speak Japanese? <laughs> 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 we did it um, before we shipped, okay. on the theory that it would do well in that country. Um, and also, since I lived in Japan before, I knew some folks there, uh, I had some contacts in Japan. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing where if you support the language and a particular region, then that region will support you, especially if you do it in a way that is... Um, localization isn't just about translation, right? It's about making sure that the, the whole feel of the app works in the target culture. And fortunately, our application was not complicated enough to require a lot of localization, but the translation that we did was done very carefully. Would you, oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, how, how, uh, how many... What's the sort of scope of changes you had to make beyond sort of translating strings to, to localize it for uh, the Japanese? Well, it's all, for Wind Up Night, it's all translating strings, but that actually has a large side effect um, because that means we have to be able to render arbitrary UTF-8 text, um, which is actually quite a bit of a design sort of, I don't want to say a limitation, but it means that we can't render text very well in Unity. Unity doesn't have uh, support for UTF-8. What it does is it has support for texture-based fonts. So if you can enumerate all of the characters that you're ever going to use, you can generate a texture out of that, and then you can put it together into a little 3D plane. But if you want to render something like Japanese or Chinese, where there are literally thousands of characters, and you don't want to predetermine the set of characters that you're going to use out of the whole, then you're, you basically want to be able to render um, UTF-8 fonts, and actually, you know, like the Android OS does that really well. So my solution was take the Android OS stuff and render it on top of Unity. And that worked fine until I tried to port it to other platforms, and then it became quite an expensive design decision. <laughs> Fair enough. I was to say, always, uh, have you guys gotten any traction in Korea? Have you are there any places where you've translated the market listing without translating the, the game itself? That was the other we haven't thing. done that yet, but it's probably a good idea. Korea seems like a market that is uh, ready to spend huge amounts of money on video games in the Android market. Um, I told but they we have the last top, top people for um, apps per person, right now. Isn't that the recent statistic out of Google? I, would not, I would not be surprised. We haven't been able to find um, a translator that we trust as much as the translators that we had to our Japanese translations, um, which is the main reason for our lack of Chinese or uh, Korean translation. We have a Fairly difficult game to translate, I think. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so I, I guess my, my next question sort of uh, delves a little bit into something, again, you alluded to earlier, um, monetization. Um, I think both of you guys use in-app billing to, to monetize your apps. Um, I'd be interested to know what your experiences were like, why you chose to, to, to use that as your monetization strategy, how successful you think that's been, uh, or how good a decision how happy you are with that decision, I guess. Um, maybe start with you, uh, Ruben. Uh, well, I've got a very simple use of in-app billing going on. You, uh, the game shows with an ad, and uh, you can buy for sort of like a $1.49 uh, ad freeness, and then you don't have any ads obscuring your play. Very simple. I didn't do a lot of uh, market research or anything, and implementing it was pretty painless, actually. The, the sample code was pretty good made a lot of sense and was straightforward. The only issue I had is um, the first like 20 or 30 orders uh, that were, weren't in Europe were automatically cancelled. And there's, there's no obvious reason for that. And it just so happened that uh, someone at Google 
was one of the people who was buying it, and they looked into it, and picking up the market team. This is over the Christmas break. And, yeah, it just seems to be just one of those things, transient problem, it disappeared. But for a while, I was thinking, gosh, what have I done? But it, it, there was no problem in, in the game code at all. So, uh, so obviously, if you're using it in a billing to remove the advertising, you're using uh, advertising as well. Um, you know, can I ask how well those two are, are doing for you? Does there seem to be a sort of particular, like, is the, uh, is the advertising becoming uh, sort of more useful or in that in terms of driving revenue? Uh, that's for me, right? Um, and the advertising is generating a lot more revenue for me at the minute, uh, which is kind of what I expected to happen, to be honest. Um, I, I play the game with the add-on all the time. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. Um, yeah, I have to say that you've actually, the way the banner ad has been implemented, it's really inobtrusive, so there's not a huge incentive to remove it. Uh, I wish everyone thought so. It turns out that on a 16 to 9 aspect ratio screen, that advert gets a lot more annoying. But um, <laughs> I didn't know that um, until very recently. That's something that I'm about to fix. Yeah, one, one thing that I think that it's really a good thing to have uh, the ability to remove ads, because if users complain if they can't remove the ad, and they'll, they'll sometimes give you a low rating. You know, but, but in fact, it's one of those things that not that many users will use the ads are you know, reasonable. So it's sort of an interesting thing. Mm. And what about you, Chris? Uh, I don't think there's any advertising in yours, so it's just uh, in-app billing. Is that right? That's right. So the game is free, and um, we actually have this super complicated system that we came up with that, in hindsight, is too complicated for its own good. But the uh, our idea was that we are not very happy with a lot of the way that some free-to-play games implement their billing systems. Um, I think that Ruben's example is a great example of how to implement a straightforward in-app billing system. But there's a lot of games that um, will sort of lead you down a path of um, purchasing in order to not improve the game, but to wait less. That they'll introduce um, sort of a false blockade or some sort of a false obstacle that either takes effort or time to complete and not because it's a good game mechanic, but because they want you to buy your way around it. Um, and no, no disrespect to the companies that are, are making millions of dollars doing that, because there's plenty of people who love those games. And uh, you know, far be it for me to say that those people are wrong. But when we made our game, we didn't want to. We wanted to be a game that is skill-based, and a skill-based game requires a sort of mutual respect of between the developer and the player. And that meant that we couldn't have superfluous sort of obstacles in, in the game. You had to be able to complete everything by being awesome. And if you decided you didn't want to be quite as awesome, you didn't want to put the time in to become awesome, then we would give you uh, the option to, to give us money. But the, the basic approach is that you can play the entire game for free from beginning to end. Um, you have to play extremely well. You have to get the highest rank possible on every level. But if you do that, you will accumulate enough in-game currency that you can then buy your way into the next set of levels without actually spending any real money. If you're not quite good enough, or you don't feel like going back, or you want to spend your in-game currency on other things like power-ups and items, then we sell the in-game currency via an unmanaged purchase, uh, which, which in just like you know a dollar increments or two dollar increments or whatever, right? And unlike some other games, you know our game has a very definite beginning and end, so there's an upward bound of how much you could possibly spend on the game. If you bought every single thing you could possibly buy, and you got the lowest possible score on every single level, so that you have no in-game currency or very little, then your, your maximum spend is like $30. Um, and I think nobody ever spends that much. I think most people spend a dollar or three dollars or four dollars at the most. Uh, and actually, we have a lot of people who have been able to complete the game without spending any money at all told us how awesome that felt. Um, from an actual technical point of view, we've had a number of problems with the billing just working correctly. Our, our particular use case is complicated because we're using Unity, and Unity is this big uh, library that's not always loaded. You know, in the case where a notification comes from market, and there's a service that spins up to accept the notification, and the service is the only thing resident in memory, then Unity is not really aware uh, or, or ready to receive 
messages at that time. So if we don't cache those those messages somewhere uh, and, and store them off for load, then Unity will never know that, that the purchase has gone through. So I had a number of bugs with this, and I thought that I'd fix them. We still have users who tell us that they purchase things and their content is not unlocking, and I don't know why yet. Um, I'm, I'm a little frustrated with it at this point, to tell you the truth, because it's been two months and I, I still can't get it right. And I've actually implemented it before. So <laughs> um, the, I think I, I'm, I'm mostly that the bugs are in my code, but it's a complicated enough problem that I haven't been able to decipher them yet. And also, the number of users who have problems are not insignificant, but they're a very, very small minority. And they're very specific, like users who are using carrier billing in Eastern Europe or something like that, you know. I don't know if the problems are related to, say, delays in market responses that are caused by using carrier billing or some sort of quirk with a particular carrier. We haven't been able to investigate that far yet. But um, as far as a marketing tool on Android, I think it's phenomenal. I think users want to be able to play their game, play a game before they spend money on it because they don't, they don't know if it's going to work on their device or not, or they want to see if it's any fun. We're, we think it's great to be able to give users something that they can play for free and even something they can complete for free if they want to spend the time um, before they actually have to commit money. And you mentioned that you thought that the, the model you chose was, was too complicated. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Oh, sure. So why is our model too complicated? Our model's too complicated because users don't understand it. We don't do a good enough job at explaining that they have four or five different options for how to continue the game, and paying is just one of them. Um, we also integrate TapJoy, which is a system by which they can do an incentivized install, where they can go like sign up for Netflix and end up with 10,000 in-game currency things. So for people who don't have access to a credit card or really, really don't want to spend money, um, there's another option for them to continue to play technically for free, although some people aren't interested in sending it for Netflix. Right? Um, there's several different options. And they're all optional. But a lot of users, um, I think probably users who've been burned by other games sort of exploiting them in the past, saw that there was any sort of in-app purchase and reacted very negatively to that. And said, oh my gosh, you guys are just, you know, this isn't really free. <laughs> like, you guys are, are just trying to uh, scam us here, something like that. And that hurt, because our intent was really to, to not be a scammy app at all. Our intent was to be a very respectful app that said, you know, here's five different ways for you to play this game. And, you, you know, use whichever one is correct for you. And hopefully enough, enough of those people think that the correct way it is to pay, and so we don't go out of business. Do, 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 if someone completes the game for free, do you give them the opportunity to donate some money at the end? Or? <laughs> yeah, well, some, users have, some users have suggested that. Um, honestly speaking, I think this is probably true for most games. We have a fairly long game, it's 52 levels, and about um, like 5% of players ever see the ending. Um, so, you know, the majority of people do not, do not play through the entire game. One of the takeaways, actually, is that maybe we should have made a shorter game. <laughs> well, you need to leave yourself room for expansion packs, right? Right. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's, uh, we're about halfway through. I'm going to uh, be playing with this keyboard, inviting uh, people who are watching on the live stream to join us um, in the Hangout itself and ask us some live questions. And, uh, and we'll cover some stuff from the uh, moderator page as well. So while I'm doing that, I will ask you one, one last question while we wait for people to join, which is... Um, Marketing. Uh, how have you gone about telling people about your app? Um, you know, getting people, driving people to the page to do the downloads and, and to rate and review and those sorts of things. Um, again, we'll start with you, uh, Ruben. That's uh, Chris's voice for Sure. Um, well, uh, there's a very simple answer to this. I uh, haven't started marketing it yet, really. Uh, I've all I've done is set up an ad mod budget and uh, a campaign which is presently presently paused. Um, but the, the Based on like a, a, a few days, it, it seems quite an effective way to go about it. Uh, what I'm sure that the app is completely 100% stable, then I'll, st I'll stop marketing in earnest, probably. You know, sort of submitting it to uh, I don't know games sites, Android guys, that sort of thing. Uh, and Chris. Yeah, we did. Um, our approach has been to try to go, try to ride organic marketing as far as we can before we start spending money on advertising. 
I think probably the next step for us is to spend money on advertising. Um, but we haven't done that yet. So far, what we've done is we've, um, we've tried to be pretty active on online. Uh, we've tried to talk about the game on Twitter and on our own blog um, as often as we can. And we've tried to provide you know, information. Like our, our blog has some actual tidbits about development in there and, and you know, design decisions we made while writing the game. And we want to have like, you know, actual content that people find interesting and not just marketing noise uh, constantly coming out of us. So we've tried to just create a, a buzz by using social networks and um, you know, basic sort of internet connectivity stuff. We also explicitly approached several uh, game uh, journalists and said, before we even released, and said, we would like to give you copies of this game. We would like to show it to you. you know, do you have time to take a look at this with us? And most of them were like, Heck yeah, show us. And um, you know, we, we drove down to San Francisco and saw folks from Structor, folks from Tested. Um, we uh, talked to you know people all over the place, and in some cases sent them you know early builds of the game to get them interested, and in other cases just sort of pointed them to the game when um, when it came out, or provided screenshots, things like that. Uh, we had a uh, Simple partnership with Sony Ericsson. They they put us in the in their game launcher for the Xperia Play in Japan, and the benefit for us was a lot of visibility, and also uh, we got to be visible at Tokyo Game Show uh, at their booth, which was a, a big win for us. So we haven't done, I wouldn't say traditional marketing at all yet, uh, and I think we'll probably start it as our um, organic efforts sort of start to wind down. But so far, organically, we've been very happy with the response. Of course, the, the number one thing that has happened for, to us uh, in terms of marketing is being featured by Google. That, that is uh, by far the, the most valuable thing that, that uh, we could possibly do or possibly get uh, in, order, in terms of being visible and getting downloads, getting new users. Can I ask you a quick follow-up on that, Chris? Sure. Um, so last year, you wrote an excellent blog post about how you publicized uh, um, your previous game, uh, Rough Guy Island. Right. Um, and you did mention that featuring was a big part of that, but it sounds like uh, maybe the value of featuring has grown, because I remember last year, um, you didn't think it was quite as valuable. Um, yeah, I think the reason is, is that the number of Android devices out there is a lot larger than it was in 2010 when I shipped Replica Island. And also, market has changed, and it's much better at um, highlighting applications that are better featured. I, I suspect that's, that's the difference. To give you an idea, um, Replica Island, my previous game, is a much simpler game. Uh, it also has a pretty good rating. It took about 100 days to achieve a million users in that case. And it's a free game with no, no purchasing at all. Wind Up Night broke a million users in just under three weeks. So uh, I attribute that mostly to high visibility during two of those weeks because it was featured by Google. OK. Um, so I'm going to take some uh, questions from the moderator page, which is what I'm looking at over on my left shoulder. So this one is for you, Chris. It's, uh, it's a what can you say about premium business model in terms of profitability? Is it good? Do you make good money out of it? The lack of numbers out there makes me have second thoughts about implementing it. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I think that um, it's extremely tricky to get right. I think that the that there's two big problems. Well, maybe three big problems with it. One of them is I, I alluded to before, which is that if your game appears to be an excuse for a monetization scheme, then um, many users will, re will react very poorly. Um, you know, there's enough. There's enough games out there that are sort of monetization schemes wrapped up with some cute graphics that users aren't looking for that. Now, if you can make one of those and make it a hit, then more power to you. Um, the second problem is there's a lot of UI involved, and the UI has to be really slick and it has to really hold the user's hand and tell them, you know, here's here's how it's going to work and here's what you're going to get and here's how much it's going to cost. And the value proposition between whatever you're selling and whatever they're receiving inside the game has to make sense. 
much simpler for a paid app because the value proposition is I pay this one time and I get this app. But if it's an in-game purchase, well, how many times is the user going to have to buy something? You know, does the user know how many times they're going to have to buy something? Maybe uh, if they're worried that you're going to pop up a paywall every 15 minutes, that's going to be a major turnoff. Now, in terms of actual uptake, I think that um, once a user is willing to spend money, any money at all, if once they're willing to spend one cent, they'll spend a significant amount of money um, within your application, enough that if you have structured your app well, you can, you can do very well. Um, we're doing pretty well. I think we will do better next time because we'll know more about how, we're, uh, how to structure our UI. But the nice thing about in-app purchase is users don't stop at that price tag that they see on Android Market. You know, they download the app, they get a feel for it themselves, they decide whether or not it's worth it to them, and then they decide their level of investment. Um, and that uh, seems to work very, very well with the Android user base in particular. <laughs> Sorry, Dan, I lost that. Could you uh, repeat that? What, what, what is selling the best for you? Oh, yeah, good question. So we sell, um, like I said, we sell basically three different things. We sell um, in-game currency, which you can use to buy items. You also accumulate in-game currency on your own. We sell unlocks of levels. So levels are locked. The first fourth of the game is free, and then to get the next fourth, you have to spend some money. Or you can spend your in-game currency. So that's how, if you're good enough at the game, you could have enough currency to just unlock the game without spending any real money. And the third thing we sell is, after level three, we give the user the option to unlock all of the level locks at a discounted rate. It's about a 30 or 40% discount. Um, and so if the user has played three levels and they're enjoying the game, we say, hey, if you want to trust us enough to, to go in for three bucks or four bucks right now, we'll unlock everything and you never have to worry about this again. Um, and that special offer is actually the thing that sells the best. Interesting. Um, Laura, thanks for joining us. Um, I have muted you, so you'll have to unmute when, uh, when you ask your question. But uh, do you have a question for Ruben or Chris? No? Not a problem. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll go back to the, uh, we'll go back to the moderated question.